Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And I'd like to thank Kumar and the Indian Food and Ankle Society for this uh, very kind invitation. And it's an honor to be uh, presenting to you guys with uh, this esteemed faculty. And I must admit, um, your Food and Ankle Society is really dynamic and on the front of Food and Ankle. I really enjoy what they're doing, educating everybody. And I do congratulate them and the EXCO on what they do. Um, so is my screen showing? Yes, very much. All right, let me just start the slide. Okay, so I've been asked to speak on uh, the tibial talocalcaneal fusion uh, using specifically a nail. Now, before I, when I, as I start, the most important thing is, and I don't know if it's a problem in India, but it is in South Africa, that a lot of the companies come and sell this product as an ankle fusion nail. Now, it's, it's definitely not an ankle fusion device. The reason being is that you are violating the subtalar joint. So please don't use this to fuse just the ankle joint, because you do need to prepare the subtalar joint at the same time. So you are sacrificing that joint, making a very stiff uh, uh, ankle and foot. And the reason being is if you don't prepare the subtalar joint, this device will fail at some time. So yes, your ankle will fuse, but if you haven't prepared your subtalar joint, because there's micro motion, that hardware will fail, as we know, anywhere in the body. If we don't get union of bone, hardware will fail with time. So please, just that one important uh, take home message. This is really to do a tibiotalar calcaneal arthrodesis. Now, this is really um, reserved as a salvage procedure for myself. So this is when you've got severe bone loss or severe deformities. And my indication, so sorry, the first one is where you've got a combined arthritis of the ankle and the subtalar joint, as we see here, commonly seen in the cave of various uh, patients. This is, you can see there's a various uh, malignant of the ankle with uh, chronic instability. And these can be addressed quite nicely with the TTC. Uh, next, AVN of the body of the talus. So here we've got a case of a missed uh, uh, body uh, of the talus fracture, which unfortunately underwent AVN. And you can see that bone's sclerotic and dead. In this case, the only real option here would be to do a bone block um, arthrodesis. And again, the nail is a good system to do this. Another very good indication is non-use of distal tibia fractures, or even if you do supramalleolar osteotomies, and unfortunately, sometimes you do develop these non-unions, which can be extremely troublesome. And you can see on this x-ray here, this is a diabetic with a distal tibia fracture. With that kind of a malalignment instability, this patient is totally unfunctional. So therefore, by sacrificing the ankle and giving him a well-aligned plantigrade foot is a better option. So yes, we sacrifice the ankle itself, but by Fusing the ankle, we increase the blood supply in the periosteum, and this then improves the biology at the, at the fracture site. Uh, then also very important, your shock um, arthropathy. So this was a, a, what we'd call a simple ankle fracture initially in a diabetic, which was kind of misdiagnosed as just a pure fracture, but it was actually the start of a shocker. Six months later, this is how the patient presents. Again, this is a severe deformity, um, a lot of bone loss. And again, in these cases, they can be managed quite well with this um, tributatal calcaneal nail. And then finally, failed total ankle replacements. So this is a star, a replacement 12 years old. And you can see, unfortunately, we've got severe bone loss, a severe deformity. Other than a, a, an amputation or maybe a ring fixator, the other option is a bulk allograft uh, fusion using the nail to stabilize it. So first of all, when I teach my registrars and my, my um, fellows, Whenever doing a fusion, there's a couple of principles you need to adhere to. So first is a good uh, exposure. Now for a good exposure, you need to know your anatomy, especially your surface anatomy around the foot and ankle, because the anatomy is very close together in a very small area. So you need to know where everything is so that you can access what you need to safely and appropriately to do uh, your procedure. So for these tibial calcaneal uh, fusions, I have three go-to kind of approaches. The first one, the one I try to do now more often, is a combination of an anterior ankle approach together with a sinus tarsi to the subtalar joint. And the reason I prefer doing this is I'm not sacrificing my lateral malleolus because the lateral malleolus is actually an inherent stabilizer of the ankle joint. So if you can maintain it there, add stability to the construct and therefore increases your chance of union. So how do we do this? So we use marker incision over the anterior ankle, basically just medial to the tib and tenon going in line with the second metatarsal. When you make a skin incision, just be careful distally, just at the, about the ankle joint, you get the dorsal medial cutaneous um, a nerve. So let me just put on a pointer here quickly. Uh, pointer options, laser. Um, you get this nerve here. So this is the dorsal medial cutaneous uh, nerve branch, comes from the superficial peroneal and supplies sensation to the medial, dorsal medial aspect of the hallux. And this can easily be damaged, which can result in sensory loss around the big toe, 
but more importantly, can develop a painful neuroma, which is quite a, a nuisance to manage. So look out for it. You then open the ankle, basically, basically going between tib ant and EHL, err more on the EHL side, try and keep the tib ant in its sheath. And by doing that, you prevent the tib ant from um, uh, tenting and putting pressure on your wound, which can cause wound breakdown. Now, this anterior approach was always feared by a lot of surgeons. And the reason it was feared is because we've got the neurovascular structures there. And we were scared to uh, do harm or damage the, 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 the neurovascular bundle. But actually, if you just push the EHL out the way, the bundle is directly underneath it. So that's the bundle. And you just push it laterally, and then you can uh, develop your plane. And you, as you can see, you can get a very good exposure of the ankle itself. For the sinus tarsi approach to the subtalar joint, so we draw our, our, our normal marking for a subtalar fusion. So that's from the tip of the lateral malleolus going distally towards the base of the fourth metatarsal. Now, you don't have to use the full extent of the incision. Now, when doing a TTC, you only really need to prepare the posterior facet. You don't have to include the anterior and middle facets. And the reason being is these are usually quite big, long procedures. You want to try and minimize the amount of uh, time you, 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 you have the patient on the table. So to prepare the posterior facet alone is enough. Um, as I said, good exposure. The next thing is good preparation. When doing any fusion, not just your TTC, whether it's your ankle fusion, your helix MP fusion, you've got to prepare the joints adequately. And this includes removing the cartilage, sclerotic bone, getting to good bleeding healthy bone, drilling the fusion surfaces with a two millimeter or three millimeter drill bit to allow those marrow elements to infiltrate into the fusion site. And then I also like to feather the, 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 the surfaces with a small chisel just to bring some bone graft um, into area. So that's good preparation because there's no fixation in the world that can uh, compensate for a poorly prepared joint. If the joint's not well prepared, doesn't matter what fixation you use, it will fail. So that was the anterior and sinus tarsi. Then the most, probably the most commonly known for TTCs is the lateral extension tensile approach. This is basically an incision along the lateral malleolus. You can curve it slightly anteriorly at the tip for better exposure of the lateral malleolus. So in the past, what I used to do, so once you open up the lateral extensile, you'd use an osteotome or a saw. You'd cut your fibula about five centimeters proximal to the syndesmosis, and you'd remove the fibula, which you could then more supplies with the bone nibbler, or if you had a bone mold, use this bone graft. But what we do nowadays, I take a small acetabular reamer, as we can see on this video, and you basically start reaming away the lateral malleolus. And what you're doing already is you're already getting yourself some good uh, bone graft. So once you get to the level of the resection of your lateral malleolus that you want, you just take an osteotome, you basically just remove the remaining shell of bone that's left there. And by doing that, as you can see, that's a size 42 acetabular reamer. That's good, healthy bone, which you can then pack into your fusion site um, to promote uh, better healing. And as you can see on the, on the right side, you get a very good visualization. You have your ankle joint, and there's your subtail, the posterior facet. And you can see it's quite easy to, to then prepare these joints. Then another approach is your posterior approach. And this is actually a very good approach to know. And uh, it uh, can help you in very difficult cases. So when you have very poor soft tissue, whether it's anterior or lateral, this is a kind of a go-to place for me to do my TTC fusions. And actually got a very good soft tissue coverage in the posterior aspect of the ankle. So we don't often see wound healing problems. So I do a midline incision, expose my Achilles tendon. I do a Z lengthening, not that you have to, you could just transect the, the, the Achilles because the, once you've done your TTC, there's no motion anyway, but it's just a good habit to do Z lengthening. So once you get the Achilles out the way, then you see the deep posterior compartment um, of, of, of the leg. Now you carefully open the deep compartment and what you should see is the FHL muscle belly and tendon. So that's a muscle belly, that's a tendon. Now always stay lateral to the muscle belly and the tendon. Reason being, so here I'm taking the FHL out of the way, that there is the posterior tibial nerve and you don't want to go and damage that. So always, as long as you stay lateral to the FHL in the back of the ankle, you're safe. You can't do any harm. So yeah, we can see now we've taken the FHL medially. So I'm on the lateral side of the FHL and this is the kind of exposure you get the back. Now this is a, a case with a big body defect stage two. And you can see this is a cement uh, spacer inside. And you can see you get good visualization to the back. Once the cement spacer is out, we've got uh, this void. And as I say, you get good visualization. Now just another little tip. If you have these, um, especially like total ankles with lots of bone loss, etc., a nice way to prepare the bony surface for the fusion is actually to use your acetabular reamer. Take a small reamer, it fits in nicely, you prepare the calcaneus and the tibia. And what it does, it also gives you a nice circular surface so that you can use a femoral head allograft, which will then fit in snugly there. All right, so now we've done the approaches. Now these are two cases which I'm gonna 
basically present alongside. So on the left here, we've got a cavivarous foot. You can see there's chronic instability with a various tilt of the talus uh, in the ankle mortis itself and arthritis of the subtalar joint. On the right, we've got a, a integra a total ankle replacement, which unfortunately has failed with significant subsidence of um, the talar component. Now, as I mentioned, I do prefer to go if an anterior and sinus approach, but in the case of the cava varus, with this chronic varus tilt of the talus, you often struggle to get this talus reduced back into the mortis with the lateral malleolus there. So in those cases, I like my lateral extensor approach, I get that lateral malleolus out of the way, and I can get the nice reduction um, and correction of the alignment of the ankle and the hind foot. Now on the right with the um, total ankle replacement, in this case, I don't need to sacrifice the lateral and middle malleoli. So I can go through an anterior incision, remove my implants, prepare that, put in my bulk allograft, and then go through the sinostasia to prepare the subtalar. So as you can see here, for the curva varus, I've done a lateral extensile, and for the total ankle and anterior approach. In this case, you can see that actually there's a nice square kind of defect left once I removed my, um, my implants. And in this case, I wouldn't use a stabilorema because I feel that a nice block allograft would be more stable. So again, just visualizing on the lateral, lateral extensile approach, how you get good visualization of the joints. A laminar spread is a great instrument for when doing uh, fusions around the ankle and the hind foot. Gives you good distraction exposure, so you can get your osteotomes in. And they're just showing that you need to drill these fusion surfaces. Uh, again, just showing again using a stabilar rema. This is one of my older cases when I still used to use um, a lot of femoral uh, head allografts. And as I say, this really does prepare the joint surfaces nicely and makes uh, a surface area which causes a nice snug fit for this femoral head. So in the case we're showing here, as I said, it was more of a square defect. I prepared the surfaces to down to nice bleeding bone. And in this case, I used a, 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 a structural a calcaneal um, allograft. I like to drill through the, 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 the cancellous portion of these allografts. And then I fill these drill holes with demilinarized bone matrix and um, um, uh, BMPs. So what you want to get to these grafts, you want to get a nice, tight, snug fit. But uh, what's important is when you put your graft, you must still be able to reduce your ankle and hind foot in the correct position. So when doing a TTC, you want the ankle in a neutral position, about 5 to 10 degrees of external rotation and about 5 degrees of valgus. Now, we used to use these allografts a lot. We now, more recently, for the past two years, have been using these uh, custom-made titanium cages. So we get a CT scan of uh, the defect. And we then get these cages printed, as you can see here, and then we fill these with autograft, which is obviously a far better um, 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 graft material and gives you far better results. And that's kind of our go-to pr uh, procedure now for these major defects. This is just one of our cases. We went from the posterior aspect, and you can see the large cage there filled with bone graft. So now we've prepared the joint, we've exposed it, we've prepared it, we've put in bone or a, a, a cage when necessary, and we've got the ankle and hind foot aligned. Now we're going to start putting in the nail. Now, to me, this is the most important part of the whole procedure is getting your entry point right. If your entry point is right, this becomes easy. You get it wrong, you're in a world of pain, you're going to be struggling for hours there. So where do we actually uh, make our entry point? So with the two ways to do it. So first of all, you can draw a line by setting the two malleoli which is this line there, as it goes under the plantar surface of the, of the foot. And then another line along the axis of the second metatarsal. And where they cross, that's usually your entry point. Now, if for whatever reason you don't have one of your malleoli, or you've taken out your lateral malleolus and you forgot to draw your line, what you can do is you, you can divide the heel fat pad into, three, into thirds. And the junction between the anterior and middle third would be this line there. And then again, use the axis of the second metatarsal. I used to make a transverse incision, which is a little bit more dangerous because you could risk harming the, the neurovascular structures underneath. But I, with time, I found that often where my entry point went wrong is in the AP direction, not really the medial lateral. That was easy to get to. So now I do actually a longitudinal incision. So again, very important. You've got to get this right. So using your guide wire, I'll ask my system to look from the top and from the side, make sure I got the correct um, kind of alignment of my guide pin. And then extremely important, use your C-arm and make sure that you're going middle, middle. So yeah, we see on the lateral, we've got the guide wire going through the calcaneus, up, down the middle of the tibia, the same on the AP, and don't forget to do the Harris axial view. Be careful, these nails, often you go quite needle, and you, sometimes you can go through the system taculum, or even miss the calcaneus totally. So don't forget to do the Harris axial view. Depending on what system you use, you've then got to decide what thickness nail I'm gonna use. This specific system that I use has got uh, this kind of um, 
instrument where you screen over the tibia canal and you see which nail and you basically want to put the thickest safest nail that you can put put in there without compromising the cortex so once you've got your guide pin in you've decided on your nail now you uh, First, use your entry uh, reaming drill. So these are anything between seven and nine millimeters. Try and use a, a sleeve if you can to protect those nerves. And then you start reaming. Now, be cautious, you know, we're all trying to skip steps and rush things. When you ream, go in half millimeter increments. Don't skip increments. Because the last thing you want to do is this ream has got a lot of torque. If it catches at the isthmus, you can easily cause a, a fracture at the isthmus. So be careful of that. Another little tip. When these dreamers come out, you'll see there's a lot of actually good consensus bone around there. Get your scrub tech or your sister who scrubbed with you to keep that bone for you as bone graft. So this is just uh, showing uh, the reamer. Make sure you've got the right size going up. And when you're going past the isthmus, be very careful as that's where you can run into trouble. Next, you're gonna put your nail together. Now, what, what's, what length nail do we, are we gonna use? We know about the, the width, what about length? So what you wanna do ideally is always stay proximal to the isthmus. So routinely, I use a 150 or a 200. If you, if you need to go longer, go way past the isthmus and then use a longer nail. Don't leave the nail at the isthmus. If you do, unfortunately, there's a stress riser and I have seen uh, fractures as a result of it. So also just a little tip, which we sometimes forget. Remember when you're reaming, you're using an olive tip guide wire. When you're putting a nail, you need to put a smooth guide wire. So remember to exchange your guide wire, otherwise you're gonna put your nail in and suddenly, oops, you can't get that wire out. So just something to always keep in mind. Uh, sorry, just always uh, very important. When you're setting up your, your nail, be sure to test your jigs. Make sure that the, the sleeves are, are, are in line with your drill holes. The last thing you want is start drilling and it's missing and you don't, you've got to have to start doing freehand uh, locking. So once you then we put in a nail, then the question is how deep do you put it in? When I'm first inserting it, so in this system specifically, the first notch we see here, that's the end of the nail. Then every other notch is an extra five millimeters. So I usually push the nail in about five millimeters more than where the nail is. And the reason being is you still need to compress the ankle and the subtalar joint. So when you compress it, that nail is gonna come proud again. So if you don't recess a little bit before you compress, you're gonna have a proud nail and that can irritate the patient. Another little trick that I do before I start locking my nail, for me, the a very important screw is my calcaneal anterior posterior screw. That's probably the best fixation you got in the calcaneus is that anterior to posterior. Now the calcaneus is, is angled slightly laterally in the foot. So basically what I'm doing here with my, my guide, I'm making sure that my screw is aiming from central or slightly middle to a lateral direction by rotating the nail to where I need. Once I'm happy with that rotation, then I'll lock, lock my nail proximally. I usually drill the first proximal hole. I leave the drill bit in there then do the distal hole, put in the screw, and then put the proximal screw. The reason for leaving the drill bit there just stabilizes the whole jig construct so that you don't uh, miss the locking uh, holes. So next you move now distally. Now, depending on what system you use, uh, the system I have has got an internal compression. So what it means is it can compress the ankle joint itself. And the way it does it is by putting, you put the screw through the tailors here, and then it's got a, basically a bolt inside, which as you screw the bolt, it pushes that screw up and compresses the ankle joint. Now, just remember, for this to work effectively, you need to have removed the lateral malleolus. In this case here, if I were to put that screw across the lateral malleolus, that is a checker and it's stopping me from getting my compression. So don't forget that. If you, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with having this lateral malleolus. Yeah, if that's the case, just use the external compression to compress the ankle and the subtalar joint instead of your internal compression. But as you see here, I also went medially on the side to miss the lateral malleolus. And uh, immediately, as long as you basically anterior to the tib band, the neurovascular structures aren't there. They remember they're below the system taculum. So it's actually quite safe in that area. So this is just showing we've, we've locked the talus in and this is the kind of the drive that we use to do, get internal compression. You can get a good five mils of compression. Now we've reduced, compressed this, this, uh, the, uh, the ankle joint. Now we've got to compress the subtalar joint. And this is where we use the external compression. Most nails have got this kind of system where you've got a, a, a heel pad and you tighten the bolt to compress the joint. And as I said, you can use this to compress both the ankle and the subtalus. So it's not that you have to use a system with an internal compression. So once I'm happy with my uh, compression, then I start with my lateral to medial uh, screw in the calcaneus and I finish off with my posterior to anterior. I so said, this is the important one. And as you can see, usually this nails in the anterior third of the calcaneus. You've got very little room to grab purchase distal to the nail. And that's why I want to make sure I get, get into the lateral portion of the calcaneus. So I get as much bone uh, contact as, as I possibly can. 
So also depending on what system you use, this is a very nice system here where they allow you to put paramedian screws. So using the jig, you can put two screws on either side of the nail going from the calcaneus right up into the tibia. And this is really useful when you've got these big bony voids where you've got, you know, you've got to put some allograft and it just adds more stability to your construct. And this is once you're finished, close your incisions. Um, so on the left, that was a cavaverus case. As I said, we did a lateral extensor, took away the fibula. We've got that alignment now much better. You can see how the ankle is nicely reduced. This is a total ankle which we removed. That's when I was still using allografts. But today, this is kind of what I'm doing at the moment. We're busy doing a prospective study looking at um, the union rate using these um, titanium cages, but it is something to consider. And uh, so my post-op protocol. So for the first two weeks, my patients have a back slab and they have to be at strict bed rest and elevation. Uh, edema is the enemy. If your leg swells, that's when wounds get mucky, they can break down, etc. So they got to elevate. At week two, I take off the slab, check the wounds, everything looking fine. I put them in a below knee full cast for 10 weeks. During this period, they strict non-weight bearing. I know some people like to weight bear early. These cases for me are salvage cases. These are patients who are miserable. They, you know, you, you got one shot to, to, to get it right. So I'm in no rush to get these guys weight bearing and, and, and stress my, my fixation. Also, these patients all get um, DVT prophylaxis for six weeks and uh, 50,000 units of vitamin D uh, per week for 12 weeks. At 10 weeks, they come out of the moon boot, uh, come out of the cast. I put them in a moon boot and they start to weight bear as tolerated. I start physiotherapy. So just be cautious when you use a block allograft. Remember, these allografts, the way they incorporate is by creeping substitution. And when this creeping substitution occurs, the, that graft actually becomes soft. So if you load them too early while it's soft, you can you stress those screws distally, they can break, and then you get collapse of your graft. So in those cases, I'll go right up to 20 weeks, sometimes a non weight bearing. At uh, week 16 to 20, start transitioning into supportive shoes, start uh, teaching them how to walk with this now stiff kind of ankle and hind foot. And always warn your patient, this leg can remain swollen for up to a year. It takes them a full year to learn how to walk and, and adapt to this kind of fusion. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.